Welcome to the penultimate part of Alfred Bunga Bunga's multi-part series on the Californian ideology. This is Kali Bunga, and I'm Alex Hochuli. What you'll have heard in parts one to four was a product of George Hoare and mine's visit to California in May 2019, which was thanks to Catherine Liu and the School of Humanities at the University of California, Irvine, who sponsored our trip. For this penultimate episode, I called up the Dutch director and producer, Mena Laura Meyer. Her Mint Film Office is responsible for a striking documentary that came out last year about life coaching. Now, if you've listened to the early parts of this series, you'll already be seeing how life coaching, which is something that could be described as the professionalization and rationalization of things like friendship, advice giving, even the clergy, how this all fits into a story we've been trying to tell. And this story is one about the confluence of, on the one hand, emotional life and a focus on the self, and on the other, capitalist markets. Take those two elements and add a heap of what's called solutionism, that is a superficial and often technologically aided approach to deep social problems, and you have the Californian ideology today. And as we've been saying, it's hardly just about California anymore. If this is your first Kalibunga episode, welcome. It does work as a standalone episode, but we'd of course encourage you to check out the rest of the series for the whole picture. It's available at patreon.com slash bungacast. So to start off, here is Mena Laura Meyer explaining what the documentary Now Something is Slowly Changing is all about. So this film... Now Something is Slowly Changing is a, a documentary on how people try to improve their life, their love life, or their work performance by uh, going to coaches and doing trainings and workshops. And um, the thing with this film is that we really only filmed people working on themselves, so to say, um, and we didn't do any interviews. There are no real main characters we are following in that sense. And they're all sort of tableaus that give the impression that there is this ongoing big coaching session that everybody is sort of part of. And you could say that the underlying question for the film is the, um, yeah, if, if we are ever, are we ever good enough? You know, are we ever finished Mm -hmm. with working on ourselves? And, um, or are we doomed <laughs> to continue working on ourselves right. you know, till the end of time? Well, I'm very interested in this process of continual self-improvement and what that means about our contemporary society. And I want to come on to discuss that in a little bit. But mm-hmm. just to talk a little bit more about the, the film itself in, in a formal sense. I mean, it, each scene is uh, each mise-en-scene is a fixed wide camera angle which places mm-hmm. the viewer in sort of the position of, of the observer and yeah. it seems to build up a case and we can talk about what exactly your the case you're building is but it builds that up by accretion and it shows it doesn't tell so I guess my question then is what are you trying to show with the film because you, you do leave it to, to the viewer to, to make up their own mind and mm-hmm. I mean I, I'm well, skeptical maybe of, of some of the things that are being shown there so then I I draw my own interpretation so I I wanted to know what what your intention was well I think you should it's like when we were researching this film I think my main interest was in showing that the amount of uh, um, coachings workshops whatever the amount of how much it is available It's like really mind blowing. I mean, it's like in the past 10 years, it's become a huge industry. It's one of, uh, it's an industry that, you know, uh, how do you call it? There's a lot of money uh, involved in that sense. And almost, well, for a certain generation specifically, but almost everyone is working with a coach or doing workshops to improve his or her life. So for me in the first place, it was showing that industry and also showing that um, our insecurities or our feelings of not being good enough or whatever um, 
is somebody else's job. So somebody is making money out of my insecurity or Mm -hmm. my feeling I should perform better. So when I was doing the research, that was very much what I intended to do. Um, And I do think in the film itself, this is also, I think, uh, um, yeah, you could look at the film in that way. Uh, But when I started filming and when I met people, I had a lot of respect for (laughs) for many of them uh, for the things they do, because I do think that for the, the coaches and the therapists or the trainers in our film, the intentions are really good. And they really um, uh, feel that what they're offering might help people to feel better. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, and of course, it also works that way. There are people who feel better, who work better, who love better, whatever, after you know, doing one of these uh, trainings or whatever. So um, when you look at it on a personal level, it's, uh, I, I've never been very cynical uh, about it or very, um, how do you call it, sad yes. or something mm. like that. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the difference when you do it on paper. I think this is like a, a terribly um, complex and... Um, yeah on meta level maybe even a dangerous sort of industry um but but, uh, so i wanted to ask you about this you said the the fact that it is an industry it's an industry of of coaching of training Mm -hmm. of therapy as well um i mean i i've noticed you haven't used the 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 word therapy so i wanted to ask you firstly whether you would bring that in because I, i mean clearly some of the sessions would be described as as Therapy is therapeutic. Yeah, we sort of made the distinction between um, these are all things that you can arrange yourself. So you don't need a medical, uh, how do you call it in Holland? So when I when I'm depressed and I'm really, I mean, like medically depressed, yeah. then my uh, physician has to um, yeah, recommend give me you a to, note. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> to, to, to go to uh, somebody who treats me. Uh, and we really wanted to make a distinction between everything that you can arrange for yourself. So uh, all the sessions you see in the film are things you have to pay for yourself. So they're not, um, how do you call it? Um, how do you call it? They're not um, yeah, they're, uh, insured. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, yeah. normally in Holland, a medical treatment is part of your insurance but all these things are not uh insured so you have Mm. to pay for them yourself and sometimes uh, most of the times it's very expensive and that that brings that brings something into view Mm. doesn't it because uh, well two aspects one is that it's paid for um which Mm -hmm. raises the question of you know this being a a big business and what Mm -hmm. the impetus is behind coaches becoming coaches simply responding Mm -hmm. to market demand and on the other side uh which let's say from the consumer side, as it were, it's that this isn't to necessarily remedy a wrong in yourself. It's not therapy in that sense. It's to yeah. it's self improvement. It's something that you would do, yeah. Uh, you know, to to go beyond what your current capacities are, rather than just to to fix some illness, as it were. Yeah, exactly. And also to make yeah, it's not for an illness. It's really to it's really all about self improvement. It's like the physical form of self-help so you know it's for us that was really a difference um also the idea of paying for it for us was very uh, important so the whole um but on the other hand of course it's 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 like in a certain way um how do you call it the the medical world is also an industry and it's also in a way paid for by people but for us in the film this was like really a difference between therapy and this self-help industry Mm -hmm. is that answering your question no absolutely no no that 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 that, (laughs) no that is very interesting and actually want to there's a you mentioned physical and i do want to come on to asking you about the physical aspect but uh Mm -hmm. just before that i think making specific reference to one of the scenes in the film which for me in some ways was maybe the centerpiece of the film i think even in the trailers Mm -hmm. you've used this which is in a big lecture hall a coach um speaking to a whole Mm -hmm. set of coaches uh which does raise the possibility of an infinite regression of coaches where you become a coach for a coach for a coach um but in that scene he notes that 
the the speaker notes that there are you know ten churches closing per year in Holland or something like that, uh, and yeah. that the coach or the therapist is taking the role of the priest, what the priest used to provide, which is a confident or, as he puts it, a paid friend. And I think that's the only moment in the film which is more explicitly cynical, I guess, uh, about that relationship, because it, there's no way to, to hear the word paid friend without cringing a little bit, right? Yeah, but he's not cynical, huh? He's yeah. serious. Oh, I believe, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for him, this is like, and the thing is that when you read books about the self-help culture uh, or therapy culture, um, it is being called this way, like paid friendship or uh, related to the church's clo- closing or losing our um, family structures in modern society. So what he's saying is not even that, um, I think, uh, that extremely strange. The other thing he was saying, which I found maybe even more disturb, so to speak, disturbing, was that he said um, that we are all experts. So that uh, that he asked people to raise their ha- the, the hand. Of everybody who has one, once had a burnout, and he says, "Ah, very good. You're all experts mm-hmm. because who better to teach you about your burnout than somebody who had the same experience?" And um, I find that even more complex in a certain way because that means i think it's really something that you should discuss are you really the best person to treat somebody with a burnout because you had your own burnout Mm -hmm. i mean it could also be a reason not yeah you could you could be projecting your own issues onto (laughs) onto the the subject the patient or yeah at least or you could also say i mean you're a very bad example that could also be (laughs) uh i would like to have a dentist with better than I have <laughs> but uh, right. on the other hand yeah um, but I, I find this really uh, something that you see in the whole culture that uh, and maybe this is a bit far-fetched but like this 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 very uh, big um, how do you say it uh, disbelief or uh, doubt about intelligentsia or about people who work for newspapers or, you know, all facts are not important. What's important is how you feel and what you've experienced. And so feeling something becomes more than an opinion. It becomes a fact. And I find that on a meta level, something uh, that's most disturbing in modern days in a certain way that uh, this loss of, uh, credibility for, for, for people who have studied or people who, yeah, maybe it's maybe it's far fetched, but I, I no, I think that I, I, I think there's think, a lot there. Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. it's in a sense. And that, I don't think he meant it like that. Huh? It's not like it's not like he he uh, he's not pr- promoting fake news, so to say. That's not what he means. But I I, I think when you hover above the film that this is something that I think we should really think about. Um, That's great. I'm, I'm so glad you actually highlighted that because it was something that I maybe had implicitly felt from the film, but I hadn't mm-hmm. brought it to consciousness yet. And, and that's right. I think one of the consequences of you know, therapy culture or perhaps the culture of narcissism is precisely that at, after a certain point, this starts to enter and affect the the intellectual world as well, that it... Yeah. starts to ask questions about what knowledge is and you know perhaps the ultimate source of truth as portrayed in that scene being just your own yeah. personal experience and self and that's a yeah that is a dangerous line to go down yeah you can feel it's also connected to a lot of developments we're going through i mean this is something that you see worldwide that we've changed our opinion about the elite we've changed our opinion about uh, intelligentsia, the intellectuals about, uh, you know, it's, and I, this whole idea that you what you're feeling and what you're experiencing is so important. That is something that I find mm. worrisome mm-hmm. because I don't even, it's also like, um, yeah, of course, sometimes your, your feelings can be very bad. Um, how do you call it? Yeah. Guides, yeah, um, guides, guides. To the yeah, tree. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. So, 
I, I want to shift the focus a bit to the other protagonists of the film, which is to say the, you know, the, the, the subjects, the patients, those who are going uh, and seeking out coaching, seeking out therapy. Mm-hmm. You portray a huge range of different types of coaching, training, therapy. I was surprised by some many involving animals, uh, some involving mm-hmm. a, a, a sort of different me- forms of mise-en-scene, um, ones with children, with elderly people, a whole different range of needs and drivers and you know demographic groups would you say well firstly i need i need to ask you this and we can cut this but i i really do need to know uh how did you manage to get a release form signed off uh and and people to agree to be to be filmed well in a certain way that wasn't really very complex i mean this um i'm always very upfront about my intentions and uh, I can do anything as long as anybody, everybody agrees. So and signed a, a, a form. So in that sense, um, I go to our first contact was the trainer or the coach or the therapist, mm-hmm. and I said I'm going to make this film. This is what I want to film, and uh, he would contact uh, or she would contact the the, the, the trainees, so to speak. And then I would explain what I wanted to film to the trainees. And then if they would all agree, uh, then I would be able to film. So the parameters in that sense were very strict. Because sometimes when, even when you have like this big um, place with a lot of people, sometimes uh, trainers would say, oh, maybe you can put the camera in the back and nobody will notice or whatever. But I never do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I, I, I'm always very, uh, everybody has to know, everybody has to see the camera, everybody has to know, because it's so personal also, you know, you don't want people in the end coming up to you and saying, oh my God, I never thought it would be for this or of that. Course. I mean, this is, is also television, this. But this is, so, but, that's, uh, but that's interesting, isn't it? That, People were so happy to have their these quite intimate sessions filmed, often with yeah. them really facing real crises. Yeah, yeah, but I think uh, there are two things about that. For, on the first place, uh, what you see as intimate in a film is often not as intimate in real life because mm. film sort of enlarges the feeling of intimacy. Um, also because you weren't there from the beginning, you don't, you, you see only a certain piece. So for, uh, you're watching it together with other people in a big cinema in mm-hmm. the dark. So that sort of makes it more intimate, I think, than it was really when we were filming it. And on the other hand, what's something that's really important for people who have therapy or go to training or whatever is that they, uh, a lot of people, experience a lot of help and insight and the thing that i've noticed most is that they really want to tell other people's about other people about their you know the light they saw in this so it has a certain religious um like what you see in religion that you want to tell other people you know uh i've seen the light maybe (laughs) you should do the same so that's a sort of a lot of people who went into these coaching or training um, uh, sessions, um, a lot of them, of course, were in doubt about their life, had a midlife or burnout or whatever. And then at the end, they wanted to do the same work. So they, uh, it, it's something that's sort of contagious. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you really, well, I, I imagine most, then, uh, most people who end yeah. up hearing for the first time about what coaching might be in whatever form that takes it's from friends or reading about it online, someone proselytizing yeah. about coaching and what a transformation it, it, it allowed them to, to, to mm-hmm. undergo. Yeah, and also, of course, the positive, uh, because I think now things are much more critical than five years ago. <clears throat> I think five years when we started, I think re- when we really started the film, which is like more than five years ago, I think, thinking about the subject, things were like really positive. Everybody was like, um, you know, you had all these inspirational quotes everywhere. You couldn't open your Facebook or there was somebody, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, making this post about, you know, every everything you do changes the future. No, whatever, yeah, you know, yeah. horrible quote. <laughs> uh, and now the last years, it's become much more critical. 
people are writing much more about uh, what is the influence of all these people working on themselves and are they really working on, is it really changing something or are we in the coaching uh, or working on ourselves and hiding um, or not looking at what really creates the problem. Um, always finding the solution in yourself in that sense. Um, so I think uh, it, it was like an extremely uh, positive and very, um, how do you call it? Yeah, contagious atmosphere. Everybody mm. should be doing this. You would be like, you wouldn't t- take yourself serious if you were not at your job also doing mindfulness or also doing some sort of whatever co- uh, course you could take. I mean, when we were I had, for research, I was uh, talking with um, uh, a top manager of a big uh, bank in Holland. So every employee at the bank, and that's been like that for like a lot of years, is um, can go to a course of one and a, uh, one or, or other course during a year. So there's always a certain amount of money fixed for doing some sort of schooling. And in the beginning, it was like you could do accountancy or you could do, uh, I don't know, <laughs> my English. Yes, yeah, some more, some more sort of technical, like, some more technical te- form yeah. of training. Yeah. yeah. And now 40, uh, I, w- I think 75% of the courses or they um, offered were all about spiritual uh, mindfulness, um, insights, whatever. That's, so it had yeah. all changed to self-help industry. And um, for them, it was like completely normal. And so every employee had like an amount of 1,500 euros, which is like, let's say the same in dollars, <clears throat> to work on himself but it was had it was all it had all changed to to self-help mm. i mean it's striking i think this is something that we've discussed and used as an example over and over when recording this uh, different discussions on this series about wellness mm. and the california ideology is precisely this idea it most clearly exemplified within a corporation where the employee instead of fighting for or being offered but more likely fighting for uh, more time off or higher pay that are instead offered by their employer wellness, yeah. mindfulness, meditation, and so on. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, we've been at several places and also uh, trainees, uh, trainers or coaches, or they know this, that certain companies offer this as some sort of um, their etalage. Do you know what I mean? The outside of the company to yeah. look good. And it also for them is an excuse or not an excuse, but it gives them the feeling that they're doing something. But inside, nothing has changed. So I was uh, researching and it was like, you know, do you have like 112? Do you know the alarm number? Yeah, you yeah. Call, so when there's an emergency. And the people at the desk, of course, it's a very stressful job because you have to, you know, you get all these calls about people who are panicking, whatever. And um, they did this... Yeah, sort of breathing heart rhythm technique to be able to reduce their stress levels when they encounter or when they've been working or when they were stressed about work, whatever. It was almost something you could do on the spot. Like you get a very complex phone call, your heart rate is going up. How can you, by breathing, bring down your heart rate to improve Mm -hmm. your thinking? The thing was, so he had this really big, uh, they had this, uh, this, this workshop, but the thing was that the people behind the desk uh, never went outside for lunch. They always lunched at their desk because there was not enough time. Uh-huh. And this is like, this was like one of the most, this was, did you think, uh-huh, maybe this is like really complex. Yeah. Because you can do mindfulness till you're, you know, yeah, or your lips are blue. Zen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this law, but if your boss lets you work too many hours in too little time or for too little money without uh, with too little interference or or things to say about it, then you'll be, you know, heading to a burnout anyway. Mm-hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's this is also of course the the, the horrible uh, circle in a certain way, and. 
I think that so when we started, there was much less complaint about this than there is now. I mean, um, the whole idea that you are making the problems you encounter yeah. in your work or in life yourself so you can solve them is of course completely ridiculous because um people companies run are run by by men by you know people who think that uh they can make money by letting you work too hard or too whatever they think is i'm not saying that all companies are like this i'm sorry it's this sounds maybe a bit no sure uh, i but i, I mean, mean but but i that's the basic I, rule I'm of really the game speaking right? in, ge in general in general uh you you a company makes profit by people working very hard and being very dedicated and uh, the better you work and the harder you work and the better you perform, the more money you will make. And um, for, I think it, it, there are a lot of cases where um, the feelings you get as an employee of, of being tired, of not feeling part of it or whatever, uh, are, are things that cannot be solved by, uh, you know, by all these trainings, these self-help trainings. Yeah. And, but I can remember there was also one mindfulness tra trainer and I told him, I said, okay, but what if your company doesn't change the working hours or the fact that you're being called day and night or whatever? And he says, yes, but through mindfulness, you may get the awareness that maybe this is the wrong job for you to be in. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, okay, but then you should have the possibility to leave the job. Yeah. But how many people can afford to say, oh, this job is like really wearing me out. Maybe I should become a goat herder in Tibet. I yeah, mean, right. most yeah. people of us just it, have to it, do... It's fine for senior management, maybe, um, who, yeah. also, who also undergo this stuff. And then they think, well, that, that'll be yeah. fine. Why, don't, why doesn't everybody just do this? Not realizing that their material yeah. situations are completely different. Yeah, and exactly. And it's also this whole false idea of, you know, the I don't know what the English word is. The makeability is not a word, huh? The way that you can create your own life, that you are yeah. the master of the, you know, but you're not. I mean, if you're... So, so, uh, I, wanted to ask, so I wanted to ask you about yeah. this, about th this self responsabilization I suppose, which is um, kind mm. of an ugly way to put it, but uh, we'll go with that for now, <laughs> where, yeah. you know, there's an internalization as well of this idea that you are purely responsible for your own situation, uh, yeah. that you're responsible for your own health, and that... If, in fact, yeah. if you're not self, if you're not undergoing a process of self improvement, you are failing. Uh, yeah. And and this is and this is aided by a element of constant monitoring and evaluation, whether that's from the yeah. outside, your boss evaluating, you know, or the company doing that, or self evaluation, the need to always be productive. And I wanted yeah. to ask you in your film, in in a certain way, do you not place the viewer in that position of the evaluator as well? Uh, because these people are undergoing this this process of self improvement, and we there are watching them, seeing whether they go through it or not. How much are they improving? Mm, I never really thought of it like that. I do think that the people who are watching it are, in a certain way, the observers of the things happening. Like you would have an observer, uh, you know, your psychiatrist sometimes sometimes have a student, or they're observing something like that. I never thought it as neoliberal idea of how do you call it? I'm sorry, I'm losing of, my of uh, yeah of of uh, of monitoring of evaluation. <laughs> monitoring, from the outside, yeah. yeah, yeah. I never really looked at it like that, and I do think also I do think that people, though I don't know, of course, what kind of people go to this film, uh, but I suspect that a lot of people who go to the film or see the film are interested in the subject, also because they do these trainings. Their selves. Right. I do think that sometimes they have the feeling that they're in a way looking at themselves mm. in that sense. I can also remember because there, there was one person I filmed and he was a, a coach for failure. So he was teaching people how to fail in a certain way because everything is focused on uh, winning or succeeding and he was trying to teach people how to fail but uh i never used his material 
for I don't know what reason, but you have that very often in a uh-huh. film. Yeah. And then he, he texted me and he said, yes, I'm going to see the film, or I went to see the film, I'm happy he's doing so well. I must say that when I saw the film, I was sort of happy not to be in it, because, um, wow, this is a crazy bunch of people or something. He said. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that is so strange. I mean... I mean, it's understandable that that would be the effect of, of seeing the film because I, I felt that as well. But it's obviously difficult if you yourself are a coach. And as a coach, yeah. as you say, they're not cynical. They believe this. They they are yeah. true believers. It would, I don't think it would work if they were cynical. I think and also I think maybe the, the people who are in the film and who look at themselves in the film don't necessarily find themselves strange when they see the I mean, it's really something you can only perceive maybe if you're not in it Mm -hmm. and you recognize the behavior, you recognize the language, you recognize how people do and act. And I think that then maybe you might think, oh, shit, (laughs) this is also what I'm doing. (laughs) I'm glad I'm not in. But I was kind of surprised by it, that reaction, because it's. It also shows, and of course this goes for everyone in life, is that we don't really know how we behave. We don't really know how we do, how we, I mean, I'm glad that nobody films me when I'm working, you know? So it it, it is, of course, normal to to find it in a certain way confronting. Mm. But uh, I, I was surprised because I thought, my God, it means you have no idea in what world you work in. I mean... Yeah. That's yeah. No, that's that lack of of self awareness. I guess is, yeah. is very interesting. I did, I wanted to ask about something else, um, mm-hmm. which we touched on before. Which is there's a strong physical or corporeal aspect to many of the sessions, not all of them, but many of mm-hmm. them. Uh, involve animals, guiding animals, touching animals, petting animals, uh, or physically yeah. moving, shaking, dancing, uh, or yeah. hugging, touching each other. And, and that aspect came through quite clearly. And I wonder if, if what does that say? I mean, to me, it seemed that yeah. maybe these subjects have become so alienated um, that they, they feel maybe alienated even from their own bodies. And I don't know. I think Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, well, I just wanted to add something else to that, which is the sort of paradigm of, of wellness that you have today, mm-hmm. which is a, a state beyond mere health. It's You can be healthy, but you need to be well. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. more positive definition of health, mm-hmm. uh, which is a way for generally quite well-off people to seek perfectibility. Yeah. Uh, but it also seems to imply an, an overcoming of, of the mind body distinction where you're using your mind to improve your body but you're also using your mind to improve your own mind and uh, I, mm-hmm. I wonder whether how whether that connects at all to the notion the, the, the very um, physical aspects of, 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 yeah, the, of yeah, these yeah. sessions for me there are two these two things are um, are different in that sense that the animals for me is different than the moving and the touching with humans uh from i really wanted to have the animals in the film because for uh, uh, beside the fact that i really like animals um it's also it made, really made me wonder how far we've come to sort of institutionalize the animals in these sessions uh, as the perfect coach in a certain way um, because they're totally innocent and there's one thing that every animal does what no other human does is that an animal never thinks anything of you mm. an animal is never judging you mm. an animal will yeah. never say you're too fat you're too ugly you're black you're gay an animal doesn't care. And for me, having the animals in the film really means that, well, I, 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 this is just my thought. I, I have no idea if this is true. But for me, it was really about that we've in, ended up looking 
for the one thing that would re that would return our affection affection but would never ever judge us mm. and uh, I find that something that's this feeling that uh, that being judged is a feeling that's so overwhelmingly strong nowadays the feeling of being looked at being judged being monitored being ranked and for me the animal was like the only thing left that would only make contact you on base of your you know your hand touching or your heart rhythm or whatever you know very instinctively that's fa that's and fascinating i i find that it seems to be it ties into the notion of of loneliness and atomization, I think, as well, mm -hmm. because, mm. you know, com human relationships are complex. Uh, they're two way, mm -hmm. <laughs> two way streets, to, to, to use a cliche, and they, they involve judgment. I mean, that's precisely the point mm -hmm. that, you know, your friends, even when they care, they, they judge, they evaluate. Yeah. And that's, your parents or, your, yeah. exactly, it, it's, it's part of the it's part of the process of, of human relationships. And so to, to feel perhaps, on the one hand, so constantly judged, monitored, evaluated uh, by oneself and by others, uh, that one, but at the same time, so perhaps alone, needing a paid friend, uh, at the same time as also seeking yeah. this, this therapeutic process uh, from, from a, the, the, a being which is completely unable to judge uh, and, yeah. and doesn't proffer any judgment. And but you should and it's not it's not able to judge, but it's also some an animal is is like is to be loved by an animal is like very unique and very special. I mean, I really wanted to do the, the with the, the scene with the pigs, but that was sort of a disappointment for me personally because the pigs were not nice at all, <laughs> and they were like. <laughs> I really had this image, I think maybe a, like a babe-like image of these pigs being soft and warm in this you for, know, for, for, for the benefit of, for, for the benefit of, uh, of listeners who might not have seen the film, could you maybe describe the scene? It's, uh... Yeah, it's like it's, it's in, a, in, a, in a stable uh, on the countryside uh, near to Amsterdam. Uh, and um, you can uh, pay to have a, a workshop massaging uh, pigs. So the pigs are in the stable and they're like really big. This is also something that people, yeah, they're not cute. I think, yeah. they're not at all pink and they're not at all cute. They're <laughs> really big. And I can tell by experience now also they're very uh, uh, hard, you know. So there's, their skin is not soft like a dog with the hair of a dog. It's like very prickly. But um, the thing is that you have to massage the pigs to sort of come into a circle of breathing and being uh, and to, um, yeah, let go of all your stress and all your anxieties and just be with the animals. But um, for me, that was a big disappointment, though it looked really nice on film, I must say, because it was al almost biblical, you know. Like it's, it's a beautiful shot, yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. But uh, in real life, it was like really a, a disappointment. But on the other hand, I think the, the, the horses were like, for me, it was amazing. I would never, ever have thought. Um, because for the research... Um, well, a lot of people we've been filming, they said to me, okay, maybe you should, you know, first come and join us. And I always say no. I always say I'm a director. I'm not joining. I'm only here to watch. And I'll observe and I'll film, but I'm not going to be part of your group mm. in that sense. And then uh, the lady with the horses, then the, she said, okay, but I would like to do a small training. Maybe your cameraman would do it. And so she did a small training with my cameraman, who happens to be also my husband, or yeah, for 20 years. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. and he did like this small session of like, it was like 20 minutes. And she said to him, okay, first you have to pose a question. And then uh, she was in the stable working, and I could really see. And I know him so well, but I could really see the impact it had on him to do this. And this was the it, horse. The this impact, was the horses. Yeah. And, and so it, the, the impact so was only for like two weeks or something. It's not <laughs> like 
it's still there, but it was like, there is something strange in this contact with a horse. It's like, because it reacts so precisely and so directly on, yeah, your breathing, your, your heart, everything, you know? So that was, that was one like of the really strange. That was one of the scenes which yeah. marked me as well, because that's one where I to, again, explain to, to listeners a bit what this scene involves. Mm-hmm. It's, Often top executives who are yeah. who lead around a horse by by a rope around in a mm. circle, and the uh, the therapist or the coach evaluates the person's leadership style and various other um, yeah. effective elements um, by the way that they lead the horse. And so maybe they, if they're holding yeah. too strong, they say, "No, you're too um, controlling as a manager. You need to let yeah. people, you know, free to do what they do." And uh, yeah, but the way you say it now, it sounds even it sounds really superficial or really like, uh, 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 like cliche. Yeah. But I, the thing is, if you really look at the scenes, and I know it's hard because you're, you're a podcast, so you can't really see. But I mean, when you really look at the scenes, you see that there's a difference between the two men, even though her position as a coach is the same, and the questions she sort of poses are the same also. But you really see a difference in character and how they are with the horses. So there is more to it. Um, I, I you know it sort of struck me. This, it's not. It's not. I'm not promoting it. I'm not saying you should do this. But there is something that's. Uh, and and this is also what you experience when you're filming, and it's really different than when you're just reading about it or you know thinking about it. I think that's right. You do, um, even though you're. Do you know? Yeah, I mean, as, yeah. even though your film is very neutral in its presentation of these things, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no music, there's no real soundtrack to it, there's no narration. So, it, and yet, despite that, you do get a sense, which is very different, as you say, than if you had read about it. If you read about it, yeah. read a description, or even hear my, me describing it, you, as you said, it sounds cliched. You, you, you know, you just laugh at the notion. But when you actually see it, yeah, mm. you do. You do feel something different from it. Um, and I think I just wanted to move on because I wanted to ask about a different demographic and one where I, for me was one of the more striking ones, which is the sessions with children. Uh, mm. And so one of the one of the sessions is a, a child therapy one. And the one which marked me even more was a class for 10 year olds on happiness, on yeah. how to be happy. And that was. Oh, the, the most first, interesting yeah, one, yeah, because yeah. that's not that's not a that's not a therapy or a coaching session or a training session. It's a normal yeah. classroom, right? Yeah, and it's a you just think, classroom and yeah. they're like twelve, so they're yeah. on almost going to high school, and this is like a course that they have uh, in the whole school, so also for younger children, and it's called the Happiness Suitcase or something. I don't know how you would translate it in English, and it really is about learning the difference between happy feelings. And unhappy feelings, of course, but also that this is what they say, that you can be not in charge, maybe, but you can have you do have control about how you feel. And uh, this is what they're teaching them. And um, one part of the the, the lesson is that um, the amount of uh, influence your surroundings have on how you feel. There's less influence on your happiness uh, than you think. So the money you have or the parents. Mm, yeah. or the, um, and I do think that this is also something that's being said. There are more people saying this. Huh? So that maybe when you are become blind, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will automatically hang yourself. But you could also be sort of happy and blind. Um but it does, it does, it does, it does suggest a very different form of socialization and, and formation of the individual than mm. what has happened in the past. The idea that, for example, you know, material acquisition, mm. money doesn't buy you happiness. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a cliche. Everybody knows mm. that. But obviously, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, it does. It doesn't hurt. Obviously, to have a to have material no. security. Um, and and it does. And, it, the whole yeah, thing does sure. seem to suggest it's sort of a, a, a different model of of personhood where they, you know even in yeah. school you're taught uh, yeah. about how to handle emotions and i mean yeah. the, the question that strikes me is will this make them more or less resilient will this make them more or less happy and and for me I, if i'm guessing i would say 
probably not because you're so internally focused looking at what your own emotions are. I think it's very hard to be mm. genuinely happy. Well, I like think that. I think in general, when you're like an average kid and things are and sort of taken care of, I'm, like you can go to school yeah. every day, you have clothes and something to eat, and sometimes you come by. Uh, stuff you like and your parents are there etc then i do think that knowing the difference between what i feel is something i can control and it's not necessarily what i am huh? so i mm -hmm. it's like um now i feel not very happy but if i could do this i could be more happy i do think then in that sense it could work in a certain way i mean it's something that you do and I do too. But the problem is when you're like not a white kid and everything is arranged, but you're perhaps a black kid that uh, doesn't have any money or that's being uh, 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 subject of racism, for example, in Holland mm -hmm. or, you know, stuff like that, then uh, a lot of things don't work because the influence on your happiness by others you can't control is too big. So that's really what I mean with the makeability of, uh, that's no word, eh? makeability, or is it? No, no not right? really. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's, so the, the, the that's whole, fine. The, the meaning comes across anyway. Yeah, it works. Yeah. So that's um, the whole idea that you are the creator or the controller of that feelings is, 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 is completely untrue. Unless you're a sort of average, you know, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. But for all the others, you know, like there are so many examples of, um, of situations where, you know, dreaming of something else will not bring you that dream. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, but it, it, but it does, it does refocus. Different. That's right. I mean, it does, but it does refocus the lens as it were on who you are and what you feel rather than what you do, what your yeah. products are, uh, what are your yeah. projects. Uh, and that's... But it's very, it's a very, uh, and that's also why I find all the things with children for me are the most, I mean, the whole idea that you have this in your class, mm. it's not something that you can say no to. I, as a parent, could not say, listen, I don't want my children subjected to these kind of uh, notions because I don't believe in the, the, the making of happiness in this way. Uh, it's just there, like also your science classes or your, you know, your gym class or whatever. It's, and I find that extremely, um, trouble. Yeah, and it does, and it does suggest. I mean, education is about learning about the world and the, and the accumulated yeah. knowledge from the past, be it in the sciences or in the humanities and etc. And this is learning about yourself, which is not an objective form of knowledge. Uh, no, and this is also not an objective form of um, you know uh, science. This is like yeah. really what a group of people have uh, this yeah found out for themselves. But it, it's not necessarily uh, proven to be true. And I think, um, wh as I said, when everything is sort of okay, then, you know, feeling better because you know, okay, I'm going to focus on something else is really helpful. But, yeah, I can imagine that this could also work completely the other way and will make you very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because also, because the whole idea of being unhappy is is, is 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 something, though I don't think they really say it this literally, but being unhappy or uh, is not allowed. Yeah. And uh, it's another performance indicator, that, right? It's another yeah. thing on which you to be monitored and evaluated. If you have you know ninety plus yeah. percent happiness, you're doing well, you know. Yeah. So, but but the thing is that uh, life isn't happy. Life is is not nice. Life is basically a heap of problems, and every day it goes well. It's one day that goes well. I mean, yeah. I, and I'm not being pessimistic. I'm, I'm a very happy person normally, <laughs> but that's because I always think, "Wow, I survived this day," or I, you know, it's for me. I n never think about happiness in that sense. And I would never teach my children also about happiness in that sense. It's mm. completely overrated. So I, I just to round this off, and because we're, mm. of course, a global politics podcast, I need to ask, 
is this particularly Dutch? And I think the answer to that is obviously no. But I wanted to maybe mm. one firstly try to understand how this maybe plays in Holland uh, versus elsewhere. Um, Holland, I think, is generally seen as a, as a quite individualistic society. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so maybe if we could offer some comparative uh, notes mm-hmm. on, on how the, how this relates and how maybe this plays in other places. Uh, and, and of course, to finally tie it back to uh, what we're interested in exploring here, which is the sort of Californian ideology. Of course, mm-hmm. a lot of what is termed therapy culture, the culture of narcissism, comes from originally from the U.S., from California mm. and it's very interesting to try to think about how when these sorts of ideas uh, these forms of consciousness uh, these practices become transmitted across borders to often you know fairly different societies how these things get taken up and what meaning is attached to them in different contexts so maybe you could speak uh, to that a little bit how dutch do you think the experiences that you portray are well, I think, and well, of course, this is all very Dutch because these people are. I think in Hol- this is very strong. This is a very strong movement in Holland. Um, I've always considered it as something that comes <laughs> from the U.S. It's very Western world in that yeah. sense. It's very. Um, it's something that you really only see in 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 sort of. Yeah, Western societies, though, like when I was in Turkey, uh, people told me that in Istanbul, people are being advised by coaches, you know, all day long. I mean, for Mm. every major decision, they have a coach. So Turkey is not the Western world, but Istanbul in a certain way is. And you see, in that sense, it's everywhere. But I, for me, it's really part of a much bigger neoliberal movement where you see that the government and the the from in holland at least the government is really pulling back they say people should take care of themselves we should have less government influence in you know um uh, hospital you know how you uh, about illness or about uh industry or how you work etc um also less um how do you call it? Welfare. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the so how the the way society supports you uh, is becoming less. And the same time, you see that this this growth of this industry, this self help industry. So it came almost uh, at the same time. So the government moves back, and self help comes up. Yeah. I mean, and this really for me is what this is about. Like instead of uh, blaming government for not taking good care of us, of not organizing things in society. I mean, and this is very Dutch, yeah? I, I understand, yeah. because <laughs> in Holland, we normally think that the government should take care of people, should organize things, and should, you know, you should never be uh, without money because you become ill. Sure. Or you should always have insurance or stuff like that. And you see that things are changing, and this whole idea that you uh are uh, the problem as well as the solution that sort of came up at the same time and i think that is um yeah this focus on people themselves is like really showing uh yeah this this focus on this individual and at the same time all these individuals feeling sort of very bad about themselves or mm. lonely but well, we can and turning to self help i think it's yeah. Yeah, we I can think it's we can sort of tie, tie I find in Holland very troublesome. Mm. No, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. And I think we can even tie together some other strands that we've already discussed. The that the kind of welfare state retrenchment, uh austerity mm-hmm. as well as things like not just the decline of the church which of course is mentioned in and and religious belief mm-hmm. and belonging which is mentioned explicitly mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the film but also other forms of belonging in collective projects belonging to a trade union or a political party or a civic association that's also on a very long term yeah. decline and i think what what your film illustrates very well is precisely this very capitalistic aspect uh, to yeah. coaching and it, it's something that sometimes maybe seems uh, paradoxical to people because they think that at the stuff to do with affect with feeling with a self mm. with self-realization are all very nice 
liberal sorts of ideas which don't which are maybe the opposite which are seen as the opposite of yeah. competitive individualism uh focus on money on acquisition on consumerism and that this is a, a an alternative it's a it's a, a way of counterbalancing against those trends and i think what the film yeah. maybe d- ends up showing is precisely no the opposite these things go hand in hand competitive individualism exactly. uh and this and is the self, result yeah this is like it's a, this is like what the result is of this highly competitive uh, lots of insecurities people feeling they have to perform and they are constantly judged this is what it um this whole self help industry is sort of the the, the the result of it for me and that's to to get to get back to one more thing about you know, we're talking about the physical but for me like the dancing yeah, the, the, yeah. was like the most one of the most important things in the film because you say we would say that what is dancing in a group so it's called biodanza and people perform some sort of dance uh, in a group of people and but for me it always was like in the end uh, one of the final scenes is that these people are all you know standing together there's one in the middle and then there are three around him and then around and around so you form this really tight group. And I was always thinking the, the person who is really in the middle, he must be or very hot or <laughs> very, very, uh, you know, uh, happy. And, uh, but in a, for me, it was always like, there's deep down, this really shows what we all really long for in a certain way, you know, to feel, and this may sound a bit, you know, romantic or whatever, but I mean, really to feel love, to feel connected, to feel to part of something, feel part of something, to be, um, you know, to be able to dance strangely and not to be, you know, and, and just laugh and have fun, listen to music and feel free to do the dancing. I always thought that also like when you're watching this film in the cinema, I think everybody would be much happier instead of watching the film to do all this you know, this dancing together. But the thing is that it really is the, um, yeah, it really is the opposite of what people are experiencing in society in a certain way. They feel, yeah, for me, it felt, a lot of people felt extremely lost in that sense, and very lonely. And that is maybe, maybe something that really, uh, yeah, I found the most, uh, intimidating in the, making this film in these four, four years, the feeling of loneliness and, you know, insecurity about who you are and what you do. And, um, yeah, I think this, of course, is a very sad sort of result. Okay, that's been part five of Kalibunga. We're back in a week with a final roundup, synthesizing all of this. Call it an after party. Before then, this Saturday, the 20th of July, we're hosting our first live chat for subscribers. That's at 1 p.m. if you're on the eastern seaboard of the U.S., 6 p.m. if you're in London. That's this Saturday, the 20th of July. The link and more information will be posted on our Patreon. Join us to discuss Kalibunga and much else besides. And of course, if you're not subscribed yet and would like to have access to it all, go to patreon.com slash bungacast. Thank you very much. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.